by Pink Yellow Wine, Taste Carcosa. <laughs> <laughs> oh, excuse me, lovecraftwines.com. A few years ago, we were in Chambers Fail with Single Balls and Moonshine. <laughs> Very big room. And you'll be able to see two no faces instead of Yes. I'm still working on my notes. Anyway, thank you all so much for coming out. Uh, you are here to hear about Chambers and the King of Yellow. My name is Alex Houston. I am acting as your moderator for the afternoon. And there's the moderator. <laughs> Stop moving your glass, dude. It's hard. All right. Um, I'm going to try not to talk that much, but I have a glass, so we'll see what happens. Anyway. Thank you, Tom. <laughs> <laughs> On that lovely note, I am going to let our uh, wonderful group of panelists introduce themselves, and from there, we're just going to descend into madness. So, here's to y'all. And if you want to start off, right here. Okay. Uh, my name is Tom Lynch. Uh, I run the Mississippi River Press, and um, I hang out with Joe Pulver a lot. Everybody has the list. <laughs> My name is Rick Clay, I'm a panelist at Lovecraft DC with Joe Palmer. And I wrote an article for the updates using the King of Yellow and the Good article, too. My name is Dominique Lipsies. I'm a nerd, I write stuff about the King of Yellow. Which is a 
about a city which I believe is in the Arabian Desert, and I'll explain later why. But so we have it's a haunted city in on Earth in the desert. Well, Chambers takes that, of course, that in outer space, somewhere near the Hyades and outer mariners, which stars the Taurus constellation. And the other uh, story was uh, the death of Alan uh, Frazier. Now, both the inhabitant of Cocos and the death of Alan Frazier make reference to an uh, Arabian sage named Ali, who may or may not have been a historical person. And I don't have time to go through, but there were four historical Arabian writers, I think actually five that I just mentioned in the article, who may have been the inspiration for the sage. Now, this is Arabian sage writing about death and resurrection. Halley is a sage who bears what becomes a lake in Chambers, which is near the city of Procosa in outer space. So Chambers basically totally rearranges Beers. Now, Lovecraft is a little different, and I have to credit Robert F. Price for pointing out a lot of these uh, analogs in his introduction to the Haskell Cycle that was published by Theosophy and some years ago. Beers is inhabited of Procosa. Features an Arabian sage who's writing about death and resurrection, and it's about an inhabitant of a deserted city who comes back to life. Lovecraft's the name of the city, features an Arabian sage who writes about death and resurrection, after all, as well as the most of Ali, and we have the entire inhabitants of the city come back to life. That's the first parallel. Now, we know from Lovecraft's letters that he read the year since 1919. I don't know exactly what stories he read, but there's probably a good chance that it happened to come close to the point. So can we, can we use this as a, just a quick transition? Having kind of established that as a, as a, as a setup, knowing that the, this context in which Chambers was, uh, these building blocks to build his mythology, who is the man Chambers himself, though? This is a bigger who I think especially in the last two years or so, has he become, has taken on his own sort of mythological uh, persona, similar to Lovecraft in a sense. And Joe, since you have a little bit of familiarity with the fellow, may, might you tell us a little bit about who he is and where, where this fellow is coming from? Um, there's a lot of people who about Chambers for a lot of reasons, mostly in the very little of his private name. Survive and we have his books. Chambers, Chambers spent his summers as an adult in Thrall, New York, which was the ancestral home, um, hunting and fishing. As a child, Chambers spent a great deal of time in life. He was loved dogs, he loved outside, he was an average sportsman from a small boy. Um, he was also trained in talent. He was trained as a painter. His brother was trained as an architect and went on to become a very famous and uh, well-off architect. Chambers studied in New York uh, with a couple of notable painters at the time and ultimately went to the Beaux Arts where he was the youngest person, period, to ever be premiered. That was Paul Sepulchre's third at the time. So here's Chambers, who has this fantasy of becoming a great artist in early art. Um, he's hanging out with really notable artists. He's appreciated. He is on the verge of being a major painter. And a letter from the States comes in and said, he went to Paris, you know, that was a lot of fun. And that some of this, and they had nice girls, I heard they do. Um, so the Wild Oats decided to come home and be a man. And Chambers wants to cut off and he was brought home. <coughs> Chambers writes in the Order, Chambers writes the King and Yellow stories. These are, these are love letters to Paris. Here's a young man who went to Paris with great adult dreams and was living the life literally was about to touch the stars, and now he's called on to be one day. So what happens is Chambers, um, his books start to do well, and he starts to just fall in the shop girl romances, romantic travelogues, um, and he becomes, in his time, more popular. 
that he spends his uh, winters in New York working, writing, he spends his summers upstate. And that's important to Chambers' later work on King Yellow Book. Because what happens is Chambers is done with Paris, and he's written his two love letters to Paris. So now Chambers reverts to his boyhood fantasies and his boyhood love, which is upstate, hunting, fishing, dogs. Um, on Chambers' property by 1915 or so, he had planted 25,000 trees. He was an avid conservationist. So that's pretty much what he's. Unfortunately, we don't know anything. Like he got up every day and went to an office. You know, we had an office in New York. No one knows where that is. Nobody knows what was in that office. Because when Chambers and his wife died, he had a son who liked wine and women and song. And we have nothing. We have 12 letters, which are all the kind of letters you send to your friend in California. Hey, you know, it's been a pretty cool summer. I don't know what's going on here. Um, we don't have anything technical. The ancestral home was purchased by a Catholic church. It was annexed. They left virtually none of it standing other than a fireplace and a stairway. Um, a house had been used for over two decades by children and partying. Um, and the house was originally in the door books, after books, and why they the fireplace. So we don't know what his library was. We don't know what kind of paperwork he had. His son just sells it all off and doesn't look back. And it's vanished from the mist. Plus, up until Carl Wagner comes along, there is no advocate for chambers. And we'll get into Darrell and, and hijacking chambers, but even that is not anybody who's shouting about chambers at that point. Well, let's kind of talk about this subject of an author at the pinnacle of popularity for a moment to then be forgotten in such a way, except for four stories essentially at the start of a very collection. And this is going to be open to interpretation for each of you. Why these stories? Why do they matter? Why? What? What? What is so chambers? That's a horrible way of putting it. <laughs> what, what is happening here that he is, as Rick kind of pointed out, he's working in kind of in parallel to Lovecraft and see unaware of the sense. We don't have his library to see what he's reading. What is, what is happening with his work that these, nothing else compares to the four stories that you have here? We don't have his library, but we have, we have those four quartets, right. and it's obvious he's read Pierce. Mm -hmm. So the cosmicism, Lovecraft and, and, and Chambers both uh, are loaded with cosmicism, but Lovecraft goes this way and Chambers goes that way. So we know it's Pierce, we know it's Poe. There's the, the Deccans and Sibius and Poe, they're, they're all through that text, but they're not as obvious as like Lovecraft or his book here. I mean, it's much more veiled because he'd been to Paris, he'd been exposed to the real Deccans, to the real Sibius. You know, and it's like it's Pierre now, and Chambers is softer. Chambers is more like the end of the mills. Lovecraft and I were the loud. So if you read Lovecraft's prose, it's low, or it changes back soft, it's softer, it's wider, it's luminous. Not that he can't get flower in the poetic, because he certainly can. Um, but that's, that's one reason Chambers survives, because that cosmicism has, has stayed with us, and it's still with us. Look at Larry Barron. Um, I talk about Kieran all the time. A lot of her stuff is loaded with cosmicism. Cosmicism is one of the major things going on in, in weird fiction, it has been for a while. Uh, Chambers, because it's a different area, we're looking for ways to do stuff like this. Um, there are also great weird tales, and no matter how you want to talk about it, if, if, if you're assembling like right, these are the greatest weird tales of all time, the repair of Stacks up. It's it's a quintessential weird tale. Whether you like the King of Yellow or don't like the King of Yellow, 
It's also a pretty damn good science fiction story that we're telling everyone who's talking. Well, let's, let's talk about it, right? In a sense, uh, the rest of the panel. What, what first captured you about change? Why, why Hamlet? Is it, as a joke, is it this, this more subtle touch of his language that uh, the repair of reputations? There is name you get that can do kind of what the story is, but why is classification in a very, very subtle way, I would say, but uh, just, uh, just to hear from everyone what it is that it draws you to this author. I think for me, the appeal is very much twofold. Um, on one hand, like Joe was getting at, it is these stories are something of a love letter, not only to Paris and City, but to that time in Chambers' life. And, um, you know, it's it's a time period where you have this, this great imaginative flourish all these incredible um, aesthetic movements emerging at the same time. And there are also people like me who just naturally uh, fetishize the late Victorian. So you have the late Victorian, you have these incredible artistic movements, and I think it's a time where um, art, and specifically literature, um, is seen as having the potential to be dangerous, right? And I think that's why the repair of reputations is why because somebody like Oscar Wilde was seen as this potentially um, uh, dangerous force within society. And I think that idea to writers and artists is still so appealing because the reality is we do, we do our thing, we try to do it as well as we can. Most of the time, the world shrugs its shoulders and, and goes on. And, but there is this fantasy, this artistic ideal, where you can create something that is so revolutionary and so um, monumentally complete in its artistic ambitions that it'll drive somebody mad, it will redeem somebody, it can fundamentally alter somebody's life. Um, and I think, again, as writers and artists, there are certain books for all of us who have to have that effect on us. And to see that notion integrated in very early. And also the view of the women. Oh, uh, <laughs> there is a word to see he was a phenomenal writer. He is he really did fumble fumble in for money. Um, and in some ways that's great because what he left us is this really small body of work that's as as fine as anything. Um, it's a it's a writer. But his point brought the imperial reputation. Indeed, that's got to be Oscar Wilde. There's a dangerous force that has the power through a form of mass to transform society. And it's a brilliant tale. It stands up no matter what it means. I want to get up to the news about this evening. Earlier, the email was on some writings of Dennis. I could have written there and still did emails being like, hi, I'm going to have to talk at you. Like, just to give you a warning, and you wrote back enthusiastically that you were obsessed with Chambers and the email. And, I mean, we were out of Lovecraft Convention. There's a few of us who feel very strongly about some of these things. But it's, it, your, the, the intensity that you were bringing to the subject was palpable and serene. And so, what, what is it about Chambers, the email, if we want to extend it to the those that like, why, I should say. And not to put you on the spot, probably the largest and most ambiguous question possible, but there is something to be said about a work or an author that moves one in such a way. Well, because I started out with Lovecraft, and Lovecraft is very much, look, everything is just screwed up. <laughs> and that's cool, I like that. But when I got into Chambers, what I really liked was the subtlety of it. Um, because I, the first time I read The Repair of Reputations was basically, I compared it to my first month living abroad. Because on one level, things are kind of the same, and people kind of function in the same way, but there's just this fundamental understanding that underlies it that's different, and you can't quite put your finger on what it is. And that's how it felt the first time I read The Repair of like two or three pages is this whole laundry list of all the ways that the world is different and then we slip into this really gentle lull of a story that 
it's so rare to actually find that. So that's that, yeah. And what you said also about, because um, I'm, I'm big into like art that destroys stuff like, you know, family opera. Um, I'm liking other examples now, but stuff like that. I tend to like that. Thank you. Absolutely. I love being shy. Uh, similar to, to Dominic, the idea of almost an ethereal sense of unreality, the way Chambers works that in, and there's kind of this wisp of something hinted at, and the more you read, the more you know, the more insane you get, um, the more you see him do Carco. So that, that kind of feel and mood is what draws me to that kind of work and other, you know, other works inspired in that, in that vein. Um, <laughs> so, sorry, again. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> At least it wasn't the season of um, But I think that also speaks to all of us, because in a way it's, it's almost a quest for an escape. In a way, because that's what's happening with these people. They're, they're looking for an act, and, and they find it, uh, much to their sorrow. Um, but they find it. Um, so, yeah, and I think that, that speaks, I think, to even the, the modern audience of the need for an escape and looking outwards and elsewhere and finding something pretty unexpected. Well, everybody's playing with the Side of me and I think the brilliance of that is you never know what's going on. What is this yellow you know, star? We don't even get a full description of what it looks like. What is that strange night watch in the cemetery? Why does he look like a worm? Is he a worm transforming? You know, and after I read the festival, I was going down with the answer. Both got the idea about birds from a poem by uh, the Poe from the Taco, which actually is about a plane which drives people mad, which probably the Chambers got the idea from the King of Yellow. So let's, let's, that's a very interesting transition point. Uh, I guess transition points for the we, we, we did a little bit of chatting last night, we had a little trouble with plants. Nice. Well, Let, letting y'all in on a little trade secret preparation. Yeah. Um, that's what that is. <laughs> um, no, that's a, that's right, that was kind of a group chat. I didn't mean that. But um, let's talk about the yellow sign and this, this, this mythology. And in my opinion, Chambers is almost more, there is something that, as you all were saying, well, it hits you over the head a little bit. We have a pseudo pantheon of things, a pseudo library of books. Chambers gives us the like the smallest sliver, and it's it's up to us to fill in the blanks. And so, <laughs> I have what what mystery? Yeah. What 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 what's more alluring than a mystery? Mm -hmm. I think the fact that we don't you know, know what the yellow sign is. You know, you're walking through a world that you walk in for 20 minutes ago, and you just have to mind the story of what you're doing. That, you just, your mind set the reading, and that's what Chambers does. He's giving us these little inferences, and occasionally a fact. But as we examine, the yellow side, there, there it is, there's the yellow side. But as we progress, we examine it. He never tells us what it looks like. So here's a hard fact that you can't analyze. And it become more obsessive. And of course, look, look at these characters. They're underlying characters. They're obsessive. He is turning us into them by just giving us whispers. You know, and it's like, oh, you start running. The signs of uh, but there's nothing there. You start working harder. That's one of the beauties of the, the mystery is it's, it's one of the things that it's so enduring. Um, it's it's why Wagner became so fixed. One of the reasons Wagner became so fixed on it. Would you mind going into a little, a little bit more about the Wagner and his fixation, we'll call that, and in particular, uh, Wagner's pretty foray into 
publishing agenda. We've got that. Right. Then we, well, we got to back up a little bit to there. Yeah, sorry, I, there is there's a lot of ground to So yeah. <laughs> all right, let me let me back up to there with a little bit. Um, all right, so Chambers gives us the King Yellow, and it's gone. Fades in obscurity. Um, Ancient Lovecraft makes a tip of the hat in the Whisperer Gardens. That's all those are. Yeah, those mentions are not inclusive. It just, hey, I like, I really like this. And Lovecraft did not read the King of Yellow until the late 27. He was doing his world building pretty well by then. Um, the King of Yellow has no influence whatsoever on Lovecraft's sort of mythology. Uh, because Lovecraft read it. But at that point, Wolfcraft's corresponding with the Loggy Daryl. And the Loggy Daryl is just past it. <laughs> He's got all this stuff from Chambers, and Chambers is dead and well on, and he can do anything he wants with it. And he proposed to Wolfcraft something called the Hastur Mythos. And Wolfcraft said, absolutely not, kid, we're not going there. But then Wolfcraft's gone. And Daryl is going to do what Daryl is and there are completely hijacks chambers. He turns half steward from the place, not a well defined place either, into an entity that gets very well defined. Um, uh, and incorporates King Yellow into Cthulhu Mythos, um, which it is an extreme deviation from everything that chambers did. Sorry. And it stays that way. Everybody, when they do anything with the King of Yellow, post Darrow, the King of Yellow is a small moving circle in Lovecraft. And along comes Carl Wagner, who was a brilliant writer, and he was a wonderful editor, and he loved Chambers to death. He loved those King of Yellow stories. He read them, he knew what they were, he knew what Darrow was said absolutely not. And he wrote one of the finest spirit fiction tales that was written in the latter half of the 20th century. It's called The River of Night's Dream. Um, and I'm not the only one who believes that it's in the great tales it is. Uh, many critics, Peter Straub, also called the case accident. And in it, he returns the King of Yellow to its pure chamber's roots. Kevin Ross that said, have you seen the yellow sign? 
not chambers at all. So that's kind of one of those old funky things you realize it's been twisted and so the gamers left a mark. <laughs> yeah. I don't know how best to, to talk, let's try and explore this, this the malleability that these stories have within gaming and uh, all our uh, writers and researchers, uh, maybe gamers on the side, but how, this, this, this world building capability, this, this sandbox that is set up, and why, why, why would you want to play a game necessarily? But how, how do we, how do we come to terms with this, 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 uh, this slow shamble uh, into popular culture that James is, uh, is undergoing right now? These are broad topics that I just had at. We did a lot of things, you know, why would anyone want to play with it? Why would anyone want to read it? It's the same concept to me, um, beyond just reading it, which, yes, it's active, but still it's just between you and the book, and you don't have any say in the progression. Whereas if it's a, you know, the immersion of a role-playing game, it feels more like it's happening to you and you're experiencing it. It's very experiential. And this kind of this kind of, of, of plot line, this kind of decay, the kind of weird that is Chambers, that is Lovecraft, it is very engaging um, to those of us that like to do that kind of thing. And it's fun. <laughs> and, and if you're sitting there with a bunch of friends and it's, you know, late and you've been up for too long and you're getting really, really scared. It's, it's fun! So, yeah, you, you just, that's why. And I, and I think the section that that is, has a lot to do with the, the slow shamble into popular culture as people are realizing that the stuff is a lot of fun. Beyond just the gaming, the, the stories, the, the fiction behind it and the fiction inspired by it that it continues to grow and reach out it's reaching a broader and broader audience. Um, and this Nick Pizzolato guy, you know, picked up on some stuff and wrote a small thing, and, you know, was that you know, somebody, you know, true detective, something, something. Um, mm -hmm. And so, uh, well, yeah, you know, he did, did he? He said, what he did, but what the hell. Um, but again, it, he, it gets out there and people enjoy this concept and it, it's kind of, Reaches out and kind of grabs you. It's, it's, it's just a lot of fun. It also feeds the popular, when you see this in true detective, conspiracy theories. On that show, we had some suggestion that there's some weird dynasty that works as a king of the old, ruling Louisiana. That kind of fact that it was a reputation of the imperial dynasty in America. And it actually goes back to the origins of conspiracy theories in the United States. They all began to be Series began in the 1820s with the theory that the three gates were controlling any tax that was even anchored in the years of the movie Toy. And the three gates, the next was a three gates at the same time. And it was mentioned that the Grand Master wore yellow, so, and he actually had some people in the comics that caused him to use a yellow sign. So it feeds into this popular concept of this strange master. from Vermont that Vermont actually, I think in 1824, maybe 1828, just another little election, Vermont actually voted for the anti Masonic candidate to carry the state. So it tells you something about the power of conspiracy theories. And I think that, uh, so why don't you keep voting against the game, though? <laughs> Something like the yellow sign, 
where the character, the narrator is not obviously insane. It's set seemingly in the real world, and yet the madness that our mad narrator is hinting at um, is very much uh, uh, an active presence here. And I think it invites the reader um, into a certain kind of madness like Joe was getting at. Um, we become obsessed with the mystery in the same way, because it's a mystery that can be unraveled. And yet there's, um, and even like Tom was saying, like there's, there's so much joy in, like, Conspiracy theories are so interesting, and there's a reason that people don't ascribe to them or fascinated by them. Because there's so much joy to be had in pulling together the pieces of the puzzle and creating this entirely untenable framework. Um, like I'm thinking of a book called Potential of the Burger Echo novel. It's, it's, it's so delightful. And so we're thinking, oh, we have the fascination of the unknown, we have the fun that comes with trying to make sense of it all. But then, for me, at least, overriding all of that, you have a vision of a world where art actually means something. It actually does something. Um, I, I think, uh, and one of the, you know, Alex Lee's book uh, very famously says that, um, you know, beauty is the beginning of terror, um, which we are only able to endure because it serenely expands and destroy us. And I think that in the King of Yellow, you have this beautiful work that has no such serene disdain about it. And it's all too happy. Um, I think actually kind of true detective is kind of the key to understanding the popularity of all this because like if you look at, okay, going back to Lovecraft, Lovecraft when people play in the Lovecraftian sandbox, it's all about trappings. You name drop, you use places, you adhere to what he wrote. Well we have so little of the King of Yellow that basically you can do whatever you want. True detective took this thing and just kind of did stuff with it. <laughs> so I think that is kind of the appeal to it and why it's getting more popular with writers now because I hate to say it but I think some weird writers are just getting tired of Lovecraft. Everybody's doing it, everything's being done so we need something new and Carcosa is kind of a new sandbox, it's a less defined sandbox. And I also think especially kind of now when horror and weird fiction is getting to be more literate. Because for me, the big difference between Lovecraft and Chambers was always external and internal. And in Lovecraft, the scary things are out there, and they do things to you, and they change you. Whereas in Chambers, it's, it's about the mask. You're screwed up somewhere inside, and you just don't know it yet. And when the mask falls, that's when you realize it. And I think for people who are kind of getting into weird fiction and horror now, that is a, a better culture to plot from. Just to mention one thing briefly, Joe was the first person to originate King and Yellow would soon be associated with serial killers, which was the horror that he followed in those footsteps. We have that realm to check, right? No, big one. Uh, <laughs> um, we bought this much. But we published what year was the season of Argos? Sorry? What year was the season of Argos? Was it published? Yeah, it was the year before. So right. I, I, and I've been, I've been screaming about this since the late 90s and writing great body where, you know, I'm not speaking of the paper or anything, but I'm a presence in the very French community enough to have like, an occasional person. This is my baby. I mean, I don't own it or anything. I don't want to own it. Um, but I want to play with it. I want to play with it in an extremely pure setting, 99.9% of the time. So it's been building. It's there. And the fact that we've gone from whole-based fiction 
Tom's crack now. Um, yeah. Uh, I think I started out with crack. <laughs> and you kind of hinted at this, and I wonder if we could, uh, you know, at the time range, we could get things. Well, part of the, the appeal uh, is the sort of the. I, I don't want to use this phrase, but I might use that term. The philosophical connotations of, of, uh, of these stories. Joe, you mentioned the cosmos is a kind of way, but let's talk, because this is not going to use it at this point. We're not being touched, we're not part of our characters are not being stabbed. They're, they're, it's, it's not violent necessarily. It's, some, it's, a, it's a rupturing of self in a sense. So let, to, hear, to hear from you all about sort of the, the, the uncanny of the horror of these stories. I think that's what allows this, this world to judge you for the self and the human. And in your own work, it's, it's what unites, in my limited understanding, at least the, the, the works reflect the change, is, is, is that, is that, 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 that destruction of self when you, when you either you, you get a glimpse of the play, you look at an astronaut, et cetera. I mean, we all, we all desire, we all are in the process of collecting, accumulating. The kind of thing you're talking about, the dissolution of self, is us losing faculties, but our possessions. None of us want that. None of us wants to give it away, not ourselves, but perhaps with some human you know, partner, but other than that. And that's one of the things that's going on here. We're doing exactly what right. it's this illusion of self. It's absolutely, it, it goes beyond. I mean, we have one level of this why all the looking at other stories. But I don't want to go into that part. But there's a real sense of terror there. I don't want to lose my life. It's one of the things I fear most. It's one of the reasons I don't do much of this or much anything else because. idea of the loss of the self, you know, we're, we're sort of spinning it as this horrific thing, but it's, you know, in certain types of religious practice, it's kind of the highest goal we aspire to, right? To leave your own um, sinful nature behind, or is it the Godhead, or however you want to describe it. And I think that it's that uh, paired potential for transcendence, uh, or redemption, or destruction. Um, and it's not immediately clear, reading the King in Yellow, what is actually promised, because the parameters of the game are never made clear to us. And I would say that it's not even entirely clear that it's set in the 1890s versus 1910, or I forget what your paraphrase says it's set. It's not clear at all. And, and it, it's, I think it's the epigraph of the terror word, something to the effect that um, uh, the madness of the insane lasts longer than ours, and that's the only difference. And I think that reading the stories as a whole, um, forces you to come to grips with that realization that all is uncertain, that a transcendent experience is available to you. But will you take it? Will you be, um, will this be this sublime experience of uh, elevated consciousness or will it be a destruction? And it's never really answered, it's never made clear. Well, if you look at a story like in the Court of Dragon, because I think that story addresses what you were talking about. That's what you have, in my opinion. And that fear of letting go of the ego and giving yourself over to something else. Well, since you brought up the court of the dragon, always, that's what makes a colleague become a sort of a bone with more souls. 
gears slightly. This gentleman over in the corner there, this is an amazing work of art where he talks about, this talks about, illustrates the idea, you know, kind of the, the, the decay, you guys can see it too, the progression of what we're talking about here. I'm going to borrow my chin. Um, but you start out more or less normal, and the progression as, you know, how Stuart enters you, this is kind of a two-row piece. <sighs> Can't hold that off of my chin. But um, it just, I thought it really did a, a very interesting and, and inspiring job of, um, of showing a, a, a wild interpretation of kind of the corruption that is Hastur and, you know, this particular, you know, mythos. So I, I felt the burning need to show this as soon as we started talking about the philosophy of it. I was like, hey, look, here's someone who brought up picture of it and, and allowed you to see it. So definitely go see that man in the corner there um, because it's uh, worth your while. Um, because I think that, that gets to a lot of, of what's said in the story. It talks about the decay and, and the almost the, in a way, the opposite of what Daniel was talking about where, where a lot of current religions get into you know, either the Zen, the oneness, or, or the Christian, you know, leave, leaving the the, the sinful husk behind, this is kind of the reverse of that, because it's coming in and gradually corrupting and, and destroying you. And as you become one with Hastur, you're kind of one with the chaos and entropy that is that. Is that. So, when you use Hastur, God is a place. Yes. <laughs> Did I differentiate? Uh, doesn't matter to me. Absolutely, and that's, yeah. We can use the right, as, as mentioned as well. As we come to our uh, kind of closing, a lot of the time for questions and comments, but you mentioned in sort of progression, does anyone feel like taking a crack at the other stories that come, come with the community element? I mean, how, how do we mention them in comparison to the four that we talk about when we talk about the community element? Is it you know, as you said, Cambridge had no shape selling out the right. That's who you talk to. As he thinks, they're just filled. He, I mean, you have no paperwork, but he thinks the publisher probably wanted more stuff. And because Chambers is in his Parisian love letter phase, we had those, um, as he thinks, those four, those last four, um, don't even have a whiff of weird fiction in my regard. But they do. It, it, I mean, it's so soft, so soft. Mm -hmm. um, I rather enjoy it. I mean, we're not kicking yellow tails, but they were intended to be. Um, well, they're, they're, they're just charming little afterwards, as far as I'm concerned. Really, like, yeah, they're myself. They're myself. They're myself. Yeah. I mean, it's obviously not a kicking yellow story. Maybe, maybe because the difference is nicely. This is a there is a character called Hastur and that's just a and the whole story is so melancholy, unquiet love, faded love, faded love. It's all reviews of the part of So that's, I mean, that's where I live. But uh, I, I come at Lovecraft now because detective fiction is really interesting.
because he had half of his narrators and some of the his investigators who then they may start out and then say the sign and then start a story or whatever. And I find that a lot of that is also true of the chamber's artists. Um, that they just don't have those artists, but usually they're in pursuit of sometimes frequently of a prostitute, but there's somebody that they want to track down and they start using all these investigative tactics. So you have a very strong parallel between chambers narrators and love narrators. Um, and then if you've got any thoughts about that, I would like to hear them. Also, my particular favorite part of Edie Gallo in the novel is The Prophet's Paradise. I think that is where Chambers distills his ideas most succinctly in those little videos. And I think people don't appreciate how difficult it is to write those little sounds. That it takes an incredible The writers appreciate how difficult it is. <laughs> yeah, you're right. And, you know, and, and let me correct you. That is not a novel that is often considered. Oh, novel. yeah, I, I say not a text. I mean, it's a text. Absolute mistake. I mean, yes. there was the first one that mistakenly called it a novel. Why God knows. But it is absolutely not a novel. Yeah, and insofar as a novel really can be fine, you can be pretty sure that that is not part of the definition of a novel. Yeah. 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 The idea of the, the investigation, I, I think, because a lot of that is how it could happen to us. You know, how any one of us could could come across all of this stuff and feel the pretty need to find out just what the hell's going on. And that's that's why I think it's exciting and interesting how that winds up working. It's kind of a good way, a common way of uh, introducing protagonists to this.
and eventually it just kind of imploded and started killing each other World War One. But everything is, it makes sense if you look at it from the attitude that's prevalent at the time, which I don't think enough people do with the video. Uh, something I've been uh, wondering about for a long time with this period of weird fiction with Chambers, Mark Ashton Smith, with Oscar Wilder actually is, you know, historical evidence I can point to and make a feasible, believable case. But what is the relationship between, and you brought this up at the beginning, yellow, in terms of the Masonic imagery and so forth. While these writers are writing, it's the same time that theosophy is very, very big. Mayors of uh, Mr. Crowley are starting to, you know, do things about real ceremonial magic that's by real, I mean, you know, real people who are practicing what they say is real ceremonial magic, put it that way. Uh, the antecedents of the Order of the Golden Dawn are starting to get together, something by Lovecraft's time. You know, there's almost a fact for this kind of occultism. And I think there are hints of that. Certainly in the King of, you know, certainly when Lovecraft has his cultists calling up these alien beings either from out there or down under the sea. Uh, to what extent do you think these writers were influenced by, you know, these secret and occult societies that were springing up like weeds at the same period that they're writing? And to what extent do you think they were influenced by that, at least in their fiction, if not in their lives?
some of the characters that are trying to find their redemption through art, and that, try to find you know, meaning in living with other people, existence and stuff. And that, that's their alternative. So they end up embracing it. And my thinking is, uh, you know, if you think about how the store was in five years, he was a nature guy. Right. And but but you, you, gotta, you can stop the same. You always you, you gotta look at HPL, you gotta look at the chambers. They do the exact same thing. They go back to Bowie, they go back to Pierce, they go back to what they love. And these are sparrows building the nest. We take this one here and we bring that to our next week, like this one here. Chambers says that he changes things. Right. So so Pierce is influential. Hastler ceases, the second chamber speaks up again. Hastler ceases to be an enemy. Well, I, I respectfully uh, disagree. I mean, at least to the extent of the matter is only the X. And I feel like, you know, that's, you say it's not related, but in some ways, it, that is a kind of direct homage to your suggestion. Uh, right. And that he seems like he's got a few yellows in it. That's the most of these. Mine is so. Oh, but couldn't it be both? And the same thing. I was going to say, oh, uh, just, just, just really, yeah, just, this would be a great conversation to have after this week. Yeah, okay, I was just going to say, yeah, yeah, you know, as you said, the store, I mean, the store is supposed to be a star system, right? And it's, it's, it's uh, or it could be, and it's associated with Alderaan and Haiti, right? The real red and blue stars. In Carcosa, the stars are black. And I feel like that's another attempt to kind of maybe draw a parallel between the real world and the world of art, which is you know, a kind of thing yell. And I think in some ways that, that interesting is kind of a sort of literature detective is kind of muted and consistent with exactly the same. Which is because it's it is a like the nature of art that kind of is part of the change of art that they think. What I find so interesting about that is that they, you know, we have heard Joe Coppola about chambers of life. We would see that, you know, if we took that as a premise that uh, chambers did choose life, you know, and said, okay, I'm gonna write these books that have no art merit whatsoever because they allow me to live the life of true life. This is really fascinating. Terribly sorry about the feedback. You're all, everybody since I was there, all committed. Uh, Even if it's wrong. Mm -hmm. Sorry. <laughs> 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 um, we just have one last question if you could. I bet. I was uh, kind of hoping, because I was in an earlier panel where you mentioned uh, uh, Chambers and didn't really get pregnant. Speak up here. Sorry. Oh, sorry. Yeah. But, uh, in an earlier panel where you mentioned the Chambers was their director, so a lot of people just kind of did a tip of the hat and someone did a whisper in the uh, But then, in the same breath, we talked about the and the possible linkage to the incident. Can you talk about the story of Harvard Master? Because it falls outside of the Chamber, uh, of the King the whole story. We talk about where it fell, when he wrote it, how long.
the, the Harbor Massacre was later incorporated as the first chapter in a book called In Search of the Unknown, which is a tale of, I guess, broadly comic, almost farcical uh, stories of this guy searching after various uh, lost species. And it's delightful. It's, it, is it a great book? No. It's, it's a lot of fun. Uh, I just want to mention that there was another novel by Jacob, uh, or a novel by Jacob, that I love everything called The Slave of Souls, which is a horrible piece of literature you had in King of Yellow. But it had a concept of a black planet influencing the events on Earth, and that may have been the inspiration for Yodhoff in this book of All right, on that note, I just want to say thank you again to our panelists. Thank you so much for sticking around.